Uh, welcome to my uh, fabulous, or I should say, welcome to my studio in fabulous Las Vegas. Um, what I'll be doing uh, in today's uh, lecture segment is explicating a 75 question SIE practice exam. So the idea here is uh, not that uh, we share a screen, you watch Dean do one, it's more about the commentary uh, on each question and the wrong answers, the distractors and why they're wrong and could have been right to different questions. So we're not using this as an intellectual inventory of my skills or your skills. We're using this as a, a way to talk about test issues. It's not a substitute for reading your book cover to cover, doing all your practice questions, doing your practice finals with your uh, provided by your vendor. But at least um, the commentary, while I won't be lecturing on it, will point you in the right direction perhaps. And at the end of our explication of this practice final, uh, maybe you'll feel better about some of the test issues. So uh, 75 questions begins with the first question. So here's our first one. Uh, which of the following investment risks is greatest risk in a variable life insurance policy? You know, variable annuities, variable life insurance have an embedded, uh, you know, general uh, separate account, which is a mutual fund. You know, so the major difference between traditional life insurance is in a traditional life insurance policy, the investment risk is assumed by the insurance company. You know, they uh, take whatever you pay them, they put it in their general account, they make investments. But in a variable product, the insurance company is putting the uh, proceeds, some of the proceeds in variable life, all the proceeds in variable annuity into what's called a separate account, which is a mutual fund for uh, intellectually. And so that's the biggest distinction between those two products is since that separate account is a mutual fund, you're exposed to uh, market risk. Uh, credit risk would be associated with debt denominated securities. And I would definitely know that less than triple B on standard and poor's is less than investment grade. Inflation risk is associated with too much money chasing too few goods. And again, debt securities don't do well in that environment. Common stocks do better. And interest rate risk is the idea that if interest rates go up, uh, bond prices, debt securities go down. And if interest rates go down, they go up and then they might be called from you. So I uh, like this answer set. All these could have been right answers to different questions. But the answer to this particular question is uh, B. Which of the following securities types provides investors with a stated maturity date, a floating interest rate, and an option to put the security back to the financial intermediary on a daily or weekly basis. Woo! I think I would have uh, used this with a process of elimination. I should definitely know that uh, there's no floating interest rate in the put option. Uh, perpetual preferred for stock, preferred stock doesn't have a, a floating rate. It just means it's never callable. Variable rate, ding, 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 ding. And a tax deferred variable annuity does at some point. now. Uh, this was a horror story in the securities markets. And uh, on this practice exam, uh, it's in the FINRA test specifications. I would highly recommend you download a PDF of uh, FINRA's test specifications for SIE. And if it's in there, that means there, it's testable. It's fair game to test you on it. Now, what shows up in any draw of a practice exam, like this practice exam, or in your actual exam, which is the most important exam, obviously, uh, depends on the draw. You know, I'm wishing for you a dream draw. But uh, that being said, I wouldn't worry about that one too much as a, as a test issue. Which of the following statements is true regarding the concept of an annuity contract? Uh, payouts are of a non-qualified or all income tax free. No, that's not true. I mean, you, the part you put in there was after tax money. And so that'll be a return of your original capital, but you're certainly gonna owe taxes on the gross. So A is false. You know, some things what you might wanna do uh, is maybe you wanna, you know, as a test, you know, you wanna be try and become a better test taker if you're not. And maybe what you want to do is like put a T or an F next to each of the things to see whether it's true or false. And that is false. So that's one way to proceed. The kind of annuity selected partly determines the payout uh, payment amounts to the annuitant. You know, maybe if I can't put a true or false, maybe I put a question mark and say, I'm not sure what that one is. In the case of a life annuity contracts, the age and sex of the annuitant do not affect the payments. No, they most certainly do. Because you know, the older you are, I don't know why my annotation tool does that every now and again. The amounts of periodic payments are determined by the performance of the insurance company's investment return. So let me move my button there. Statements is true. So the title annuity, yeah, that determines it, right? If you choose life only, for example, life only, test point gives you the largest monthly payment, or you can pick joint and last survivor. So the answer there is B. Very important concept to know that we're always doing business in a mutual fund. We're always doing business in a mutual fund based on the next calculation of the NAV. 
You're always doing a business based on the next calculation of the NAV. Hold on, I'm just checking my speaker. I don't know why he does that every once in a while. Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Okay, so it looks like my audio is still good. I want to make sure I'm not talking to myself here. Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Let me do a real test here real quick. Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm gonna continue on. Let's see where I'm at in this thing. I'm not sure if I had an audio problem or not. And so I wanna make sure that we're not too far along. Yeah, question four, okay, cool. Uh, we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV, the next calculation of the NAV. So that's called forward pricing, very testable. And so we're always going to be doing business based on that next calculation. There's two styles of voting. The style of voting would be stipulated in the corporate charter. And one style of voting stipulated in the corporate charter would be statutory. The other would be cumulative. Statutory voting means if I have 500 shares and we're voting on three board seats, 500 yes, no, 500 yes, no, 500 yes, no. You know, if it's a uh, cumulative, I multiply the number of shares I have, the number of shares I have, uh, okay, we're going to start over on this thing. I'm killing this thing because it keeps giving me the, Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Okay, so we're back in business here. Uh, and so that would be stipulated in the corporate charter, stipulated in the corporate charter. And uh, if it's a statutory like it is here, that means again, 500 yes, no. Now what you should be able to do is know that cumulative voting protects minority shareholders more. Anyways, under system of statutory voting, the position's vacant on the board, a director's president at the meeting, shares owned by the shareholder. There you go, as many shares as you have, that's how many votes you have. Shares vote, not people. Shares vote, not people. Should be able to distinguish on your exam the distinction between uh, statutory and cumulative. You should be able to distinguish uh, between those two. A broker dealer has accepted payment for a new issue from a customer win. So when we're doing a new issue in the primary market, we enter into, once we do our S1 registration statement, we enter into what's called the cooling off period of the quiet time, which is a minimum of uh, 20 days. And very testable of what I can and can't do during that cooling off period. What I can do is send the customer a preliminary prospectus, also known as a red herring. And it has pretty much all the information the customer needs to make an informed decision, except, except the final offering price, which is pretty uh, important. That preliminary perspective is also referred to as a red herring. Now, based on that, I can accept indications of interest, which are test question non-binding on all parties. And that means I can't accept payment until we get to the effective date. The effective date is when the deal you know, gets done. So I call you and say the deal is now effective. So the effective date is when we can accept, uh, accept money. I definitely know that cooling off period is 20 days. Uh, preliminary perspective is also known as a red herring, a very testable process. A married couple who earned income that exceeded 300 grand in each of the prior two years and is reasonably expects to do the same this year. You know, the point here is if these uh, people make an inv a bad investment, so what? Well, I mean, so what means just work harder next year. You know, they have time to make that up. And if they're not sophisticated, they can rent somebody who is. And so th these folks are allowed to participate in what we call private placements. You know, 33, the Prospectus Act says, if I'm gonna sell brand new securities to the public, what kind of securities brand new to whom the public, I have to make a registration statement, but there are some exempt transactions available. 
And so I said to the SEC, yes, I did sell brand new securities, but I not, did not sell them to the public. I did a private placement under Reg D. I only sold it to institutional investors and accredited investors and accredited investor. Now, by the way, I'd also know what it would be for somebody who's a single. It'd be if it's at a single person who earned income that exceeded 200 grand for prior two years. And the other one would be net worth of a million exclusive of primary residence. Now, a D is also a correct answer, not to this question, but a quib test question is an institutional buyer who has assets under management, AUM, of 100 million or more. That's called 144A. So if they were asking about 144A, D would have been the right answer. And there's a couple of test questions about a quib. I just gave you one. What is it? It's an institutional investor with assets under management of 100 million or more. The second question is, what are they allowed to do? They're allowed to buy unregistered foreign and domestic securities. So that could have been a right answer. The answer to this one is B. Uh, Uniform Transfer to Minors Act are open under the account of the minor. Uh, I would expect to see one or two test questions on UTMAs or UGMAs, Uniform Gift to Minors Act, which is the earlier version of this, and Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. The, the major distinction is Uniform Transfer to Minors Act, the custodian can stipulate the age of 25, whereas UGMA would be 18 or 21. I'd also know that um, accounts are not allowed to be engaged in uh, margin. I'd also know that uh, one minor, one custodian per account. And I would definitely know that the uh, gift is irrevocable. You can't change your mind. Uh, an investor owns 100 shares of common stock at the current market price of 50. Boy, you got to be very careful on this one. If XYZ conducts a reverse split, ooh, my. So not a forward split, it's a reverse split. So that means now you have one share for every two you had uh, previously. I hope you remember me telling you this. You always end up with either a forward split, more shares at a lower price, or in a reverse split, less shares at a higher price. So we're gonna be looking, shopping our answer set up. It's a reverse split, looking for something that has less number of shares, because that's the whole point. And so less shares of 100, so it's either A or B, at something more than 50, and so the answer there is B. There's been no change in my proportionate ownership. Uh, I personally don't like this question because typically reverses are done when the stock is like two and we're trying to get it into a more respectable area. You know, a $50 stock is a perfectly reasonable stock and this makes no sense because it, it makes the you know, stock less marketable. But you know, well, you get all kinds of different kinds of questions, right? Now be careful, if you didn't read carefully, RTFQ, if this were a forward split, you would have more shares at a lower price. So be careful if there's a forward or reverse on your test. Uh, you don't need to do the math. You know, you can do it if you want to, but you don't need to do the math. In a reverse split, more shares at a lower price, there's only gonna be one answer available to you that meets that criteria. Forward split, more shares at a lower price. Which of the following best describes the essential difference between a primary distribution and a secondary uh, distribution? A primary distribution versus a secondary distribution. So primary means the issuer is receiving the money. Secondary means the previous owner is receiving the money. And so, you know, there's a major difference between those two. So here, let's see A. A primary distribution can only be made for equity issues. No, that's not true. I mean, you know, primary can be bonds. It doesn't have to be equity. There's a lot of primary distributions that involve the distribution of a debt security. Well, secondary can be equity debt. That's kind of nonsensical because it wouldn't be in the secondary market unless there was a primary market. Now, I would refer you to my lecture I did. Uh, it's posted on the channel on secondary markets. It's, you know, overkill on those, but, you know, it's te very testable. Uh, B, a primary distribution can only be made for issues that exceed a specified dollar amount, while a secondary distribution can be made for issues of all sizes. That's not true either. A primary distribution is made at a fixed public offering price, while secondaries are made at a current. No, secondary, if I buy enough of it, yeah, maybe I'll get a discount. So that's not true. D. A primary distribution, there we go. Yeah, secondary involves the sale of already issued security. So you know, I was a big nut and a big fan of the Hyatt Hotel initial public offering because the stock being offered was a secondary distribution. It was the Pritzker clan selling the stock they owned in Hyatt. None of the proceeds went to the issuer Hyatt Hotels. So you're entitled to know whether the proceeds 
are going to the previous owners or the proceeds are going to the issuer, uh, D as in dog. Which of the following outcomes are possible for writer of a covered call? There are two types of call contracts that you can write. You can write a naked call, short writer, you know, seller of a call and agree to sell stock you don't own. That is called a naked or uncovered call. And they're really foolish. You hope the contract expires, you keep the premium. And a naked or uncovered call, if you're wrong, the stock goes up to an infinite amount and you have to go in the open market and buy the stock and deliver it the strike. And so if it was an uncovered call, it would be B as in boy. Now a covered call, you're agreeing to actually sell stock you own. I'm agreeing to sell stock I own. So the example I uh, use in the lecture is I buy 100 shares of Apple at uh, 128 and I sell a 130 call for five. I've agreed to deliver the Apple at 130. So I don't participate past the strike price. 130 or higher, the stock is going to get called away from me. So my profit is limited. If I'm wrong, the uh, Apple goes to zero and I lose whatever I paid for the stock, less what I bought in on the premium. And so the answer to this one is A. And I would be able to distinguish a covered call from an uncovered or naked call. Uh, I would refer to you to lecture number two in my options series. I have a, a four series, uh, four lectures on options. Lecture two is all about uh, covered calls and protective puts and all that kind of stuff. Which of the following products is adversely impacted by credit rating? So it means it's what we're looking for in this answer set is a debt security, a debt security. And you know, mutual funds, no, I own mutual funds. They may own bonds, but that's not a credit rating. Mutual funds don't have credit ratings. A unit investment trust is a fixed portfolio of securities, but it too doesn't have a credit rating. ATFs, exchange traded funds, own securities, they don't have credit ratings. But you know, they actually in an ETF do own the underlying stuff. There's a custodian and if I buy an ETF for the S&P 500, the company that has custody of the assets. Now in an ETN, the uh, issuer is a financial institution. And what they've agreed to do is pay me based on whatever that benchmark does. For example, if I buy an S&P 500 exchange traded note, not exchange traded fund, exchange traded note, and the market goes up 26%, they're agreeing that they will give me $126,000. Now I'm taking the chance that they may or may not be able to do that, right? That they may or may not be able to do that. And so, Exchange traded notes are debt denominated security. I would have no problem buying one of these from JP Morgan or you know, Bank of America or Wells Fargo or you know, Schwab or Vanguard. But you know, if it was Acme ETN sponsor, I'd probably say, eh, man, I don't know about that. Uh, right now, there's been some uh, major defaults in the ETN market. By the way, it's a sophisticated product. So you know, Fenra gets a little upset when you are selling structured and, and complex, sophisticated products to retail investors who may not understand the product, even more scary, Maybe even the rep doesn't understand the product. Uh, yeah, savings for banks uh, is FDIC. You know, boy, you want to get all the aim and shoot point and click questions on your exam that you're entitled to. You know, SIPIC would be for a broker dealer. You know, and you definitely should know about the SEIPC coverage of 500, of which no more than 250 can be cash. So make sure you got that one as well. Uh, this is recognition. This is recognition. So, you know, when you buy a bond in the secondary market, you know, for example, a Ford Motor Company issued some debentures here recently. And these Ford Motor Company debentures had 10 years to maturity and they were callable in five years at par. And they were MS. That means they pay interest March and September. Very important to know that bonds pay semi annually. So if I sold these bonds today to you, let's see, today is January 16th. You're going to be an owner on T plus two. So, well, today is not a business day. So sorry, let's say it's Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday would be when ownership changes hands. That's called regular way settlement. And I would definitely know that regular way settlement for corporates and munis is T plus two. T plus two. And I'm going to say, listen, I held the bonds for all of September, all of October, all of November, all of December, and part of January. The vast majority of that check you're going to get on March 1st from Ford does not belong to you. It belongs to me. And the Uniform Practice Code, which standardizes trading practices, says you, the buyer, are going to pay me, the seller, the dollar amount of that accrued interest. And we didn't want our high talent men and women to have to remember nursery rhymes and knuckle humps about how many days have September. And so we said it's a 30-day month, aim and shoot, point and click for corporates and unions. Now, be careful on this. What I mean by this is, you know, right here, let's just go ahead and 
get ourselves a box. For corporate communities, I definitely know the regulatory settlement is T plus two. And then D could have been the answer. D would have been the answer for gubbies. You know, gubbies are goofy and that'd be T plus one. So it could have been D, could have been D, but it's A for this one. Corporate immunities settle T plus two and they use 30 day months. And that's the recognition test question. By the way, they, the styles of question get a recognition, practical application, you know, recognition is like this one, practical application is like, what's the break even? And the last question you get are judgment questions where you go, hmm, you know, you have to figure it out. Uh, stability of a debt portfolio is greatest when. So the stability of your bond portfolio or debt portfolio is going to be dependent on what interest rates are doing. You know, if anybody ever asks you about economics or finance or investments and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound good. People say, well, what about them? You say they fluctuate. You know, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. When interest rates go down, bond prices go up. And, you know, both of those can be a problem. You know, for example, it sounds like it's wonderful if interest rates go down and my bonds go up, but then they're more likely to be called away from me. Long-term maturities are always more volatile because whatever happens short-term gets extrapolated. So the safest place to be in terms of having the greatest stability would be short-term. So short-term debt instruments are less, are more stable, less volatile than longer term. By the way, this, you could expect a reverse of this question by saying which of the following would be most volatile in a debt portfolio, and it'd be the long-term uh, debt. Okay, so registered rep is reviewing the following. So I have 30% in an energy stock. I have 30% in a healthcare stock. I have 30% in diversified portfolio stocks, and I got 10% on money market, wow. That's pretty aggressive to have 90% in equity. Whew. So which of the following risks are in here? Credit risk. Well, there's no credit risk here because the only debt I own is through the context of a money market fund. And that money market fund, they own high quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. So it's certainly not A. Uh, liquidity. No, all these stocks can be turned in the ETF back into money on T plus two. I just call my broker and sell the ABC or the XYZ or the ETF and I've got my money. So I certainly don't have any liquidity risk. Uh, political risk, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, there might be some legislative risk. I don't know what kind of energy sector ABC is in, but you know, it looks like I'm diversified there in terms of uh, political risk. Non-systematic risk is also known as selection risk. And yeah, uh, here it looks like what I have is a lack of diversification, right? Uh, I have, a, so it says, which of the following risks is inherent? It looks like I've got this thing uh, locked up and a bunch of equity securities. So uh, it looks like non-systematic. Uh, which of the following U4? You know, now it's not testable, but in our business, if you can check every box on the U4, no, that is a clean U4. If you have any yes answers on that, if you have any yes answers on that, that's called a dirty U4. And some U4s are dirtier than others. There are three reasons to be disqualified by statute. One of those is a felony conviction within the last 10 years. Another is a misdemeanor involving embezzlement of money and securities uh, within 10 years. And the last is, have you been denied, suspended, or revoked registration in the past? The rest of these may require disclosure, but they're not reasons for a statutory disqualification. So it's any felony, so it's D. It's D. Be careful, RTFQ, read the full question, not a charge for felony, but a conviction. A registered rep wants to participate in a private securities transaction. Now, if you don't do this properly, it's called test questions selling away. And so you wanna make sure you're doing this correctly if you're gonna get involved in a securities transaction not sponsored by your employing broker dealer. So you request a meeting with your supervisor to lay out the structure of the deal. Uh, I don't think so. You know, I mean, that's maybe a good thing, but that's not what the requirements are. You call your supervisor and just tell them you're gonna do it. You inform them in your potential and no. Written notice, given that you can make written notice, that's always preferable, always preferable than just saying you're not gonna do it. Now, if you don't do this, I would definitely know that if you don't do this properly, it's called selling away. Let's just put that in our text box here. You know, you might get a question that goes something like, an associated person sells an investment not sponsored by the employing broker dealer. This is a prohibited practice and is known as, and you gotta come up with selling away.
Which of the following situations is an employee of a public company permitted to trade upon information without violating insider trading law? So inside uh, information as it relates to this violation would be material non-public, material non-public information. So let's look at A, an independent securities analyst explains to the employee why the earnings for the company next quarter could be marketably poorer than expected. Well, that analyst is not only talking to you, he's probably talking to a lot of folks, probably talking to a lot of folks. And so I don't think that uh, is material non-public. Let's look at B. The employee's neighbor works for the government and informs him the government will award a major contract. That sounds like material non-public information. C, the employee's spouse works in the corporate headquarters and shares with him a conversation she overheard about a possible acquisition. That is material non-public information. A coworker informs the employee of a conversation he had with the administrative uh, assistant to the general counsel about a development in a class auction, material non-public. So given that answer set, the answer is A. Now, by the way, broker dealers also have to have written supervisory procedures about how they're going to handle um, enforcement of the Insider Trading Act of 88. Uh, I like to use a T. There's a lot of different ways to do uh, options. And so be careful, you know, pick a method or process. And so what I like to do is I like to use dollars out versus dollars in. And again, I would refer you to my lecture if, you know, you, you know, haven't uh, done options yet. So here I buy one ABC January 35 put for three. So I established the choice to sell the stock at 35 and for that I paid three. And then I buy a hundred shares of ABC stock at 35. So I'm out 38, three points for the protection, $35 for the stock. Now, break-even is ultimately the number that would make those columns uh, balance because that's what break-even is, right? You can either make money, lose money, or break-even. Break-even is when you neither make nor lose. Now, if you need practice uh, you know, with a T or some people like debits or pluses or minuses, I would refer you again to options lecture number three, where I spend a whole hour plus going over uh, stock positions plus option positions. But now I can just shop the answer set. I'm looking for one that makes the columns balance. Ding, 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 ding. That's the yeah, break even. Nobody does things to break even. You know, here I'm trying to have the ability to participate in a big price increase. Uh, by the way, the only loss now is anytime I want, I can sell the stock at 35. So my max loss is A, three points. But the answer to this question, is 38. Now be careful, the break-evens when you have stock and options is different than when you just have the options, so. Uh, boy, you, I'd flunk you on the entire exam, but you said partnership or liquid and uh, transparent, they are not. You can't get in or in out of a direct participation program, also known as a partnership, without permission of the general partner. So you should definitely know on your exam that partnerships are not liquid, they're not transparent. Right now, a direct participation program partnership that's making the news is the Washington Redskins. You know, the guy who's the general partner is being accused of not providing transparency to the limited partners. And they're upset because they want to sell their uh, partnership interest in the Washington, oh, sorry, uh, the Washington football team. I forgot we've changed the name, my bad. As you were the Washington football team. And the general partner is not allowing them to sell their interest in the Washington football team. So they don't have liquidity, they don't have transparency, and hence while they're suing. So why would you buy a partnership? Well, you would hope that your partnership in whether it's real estate or sports team or you know, uh, you know whatever your oil and gas would give you a return that is not correlated with other parts of your portfolio. That's what you're hoping. Uh, market related correlations with higher average returns. Now, you, you know, it may or may not work, but you're hoping to have non-correlated returns. It means they go opposite direction. So if your stock portfolio is going down, you're hoping your partnership is going up. Uh, Market-related correlations, higher average returns, investors direct purchase of stock. No, no. So, B. Under industry regulations, this is stupid but testable. Stupid but testable. What I mean by that is in the real world, I, I can't imagine this ever comes up. But, you know, this is a, if you're opening a new margin account and you're investing $1 to uh, $2,000 or, you know, $1,999, you're just going to pay 100%. And if you're paying, opening a new account and you're buying two grand to four grand, 
you're going to pay two grand. And then over that, you're just going to pay 50%. And so, you know, who knows what version of this you're going to get. Here I bought 100 shares at 30. And so, you know, reg T margin call is half would be $1,500. But this is a new account. And so since it's a new account, it's not going to be $1,500. It's going to be two grand. So very much a test issue. And as I mentioned, what they like to do is either give you under two where you pay in full or between two and four where you pay two or over four in which you pay 50%. So stupid, but testable. By the way, when you come back to take your, your seven, it's on the seven, it's on the 24. I mean, it's everywhere. So I don't know why, but oh, well. Which of the following is true regarding a customer account held in tenants common? So what you gotta be able to do on your exam is contrast joint tenants with rights or survivorship worth uh, tenants in common. How are they different? How are they different? And one way in which they're very different is what happens when somebody dies. With joint tenants with rights or survivorship, with joint tenants with rights or survivorship, when somebody dies, the, the, uh, the seat and share goes to the surviving party. Whereas in tenants in common, when somebody dies, it goes to their estate or their beneficiary. And so that is very much a testable point you need to be able to contrast on the exam. There's two uh, styles of bankruptcy, chapter seven, complete liquidation of the firm, corporation and chapter 11. Chapter 11 means we're gonna reorganize. This is very testable. They're gonna ask, ask this from junior to senior or senior to junior in terms of uh, bankruptcy. You know, the common stockholders are last in line. The preferred stockholders are uh, senior to the common, but junior to the debt the unsecured debt, and then the secured debt. That's from junior to senior. From senior to junior, it's secured debt, unsecured debt, preferred and common. Uh, very much uh, something you should understand, the sequential where people come in line in terms of uh, bankruptcy. You know, capitalism without failure is kind of like religion without hell. So, you know, what happens if, you know, we can't deliver our products and services at excess of raw material and labor? Uh, FinCEN, I would definitely know. FinCEN is the Department of Treasury uh, where we send, uh, it's a part of the Department of Treasury where we send our CTRs, our currency transaction reports. It's where we spend our suspicious activity reports. Uh, very testable. Uh, money laundering isn't enforced under SEC or 33 or 40. It's part of the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, I, make sure you're solid on all that stuff. Uh, you know, uh, FinCEN, Currency transaction reports, suspicious activity reports, the five grand, uh, the 10 grand, you know, what is structuring, what are the stages of money laundering, placement, layering, integration. You're, you know, we don't know what questions you're going to get. That's why you want to do a lot of practice finals. We're doing this one. I'm explicating this practice final. And again, we're not lecturing here. We're just going over and talking about right answers, why they're right, you know, what wrong answers that could be right. That's what explication means, by the way, is just making commentary. And you certainly want to make sure you do all your practice finals. One of the biggest sins you can commit is not doing all your practice questions that are available to you. You know, sometimes when I'm, you know, surfing the internet and some of these uh, message boards, I'll say, well, can I just get away with buying the Q bank and not the class or the class, not the Q bank, or, you know, you should spend all your resources. And the one we're doing right now comes from Fenra. I think it's excellent. I tell people to do it three times, you know, once to do an intellectual inventory and maybe the night before and morning up just to get your, your circadian rhythm going. Most people don't really wake up thinking, no, you know, SIE. <laughs> so, you know, it's a good way to kind of get the juices going. So uh, make sure you do all your entitled. This one particularly, right? It's free. It's, you know, offered by the uh, Fender. Now, Fender would be the first to tell you this doesn't reflect, you know, the, your actual exam, but I, I tend to think it's a good kind of a, the flavor is, is a pretty good. I like the flavor of it in terms of the uh, debrief from the actual exam. So uh, make sure you take advantage. A firm is a participant in a public offering to sell a substantial amount of the securities to its customers. Okay, so the firm agrees to repurchase sales at no less than the original sales price. Now, be careful here. If this was a relationship I had with an issuer to buy unsold securities, a firm commitment, that's different. But we never hold our, our customers harmless. Now, if you say, Dean, if I buy this new issue, is my capital at risk? I go, absolutely, your capital's at risk. And so we never agree to hold our customers harmless from investments. I mean, if they want to be held harmless, you know, the guy, you know, when I was a practitioner and uh, I was thinking about making an exception of managing money for him and his name is John. I said, John, how are you going to feel if I lose, if you lose this money? He said, I'd kill myself. 
I said, well, then John, you shouldn't be ma making investments in the securities, making investments in securities. You need to talk to your insurance agent about an insurance product or your banker about banking products. Securities products have risk, right? So um, we uh, have two that say prohibited. And one says it's prohibited and it's fraudulent to manipulate to hold customer harmless. And C says, unless I set aside the funds. No, 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 no. Right, so uh, be careful on this one. If this was an underwriting, if this was an underwriting and you're buying it from the issuer, that's different than agreeing to buy it back from the, the customer. A customer is an officer of a company that's involved in some significant changes. All the following are examples of corporate fair affairs. Remember this, another question about material non-public information. So pending transaction is certainly material non-public information. A declared stock dividend has been already announced to the public. Declared means the board had their board meeting, they've declared a dividend. That is public information. Top management changes are not uh, public. That's material non-public. And imminent financial liquidity problems is material. So the ones that's in the normal course of the business here and is not material non-public is declaration of a, a cash or stock dividend. Under FINRA rules, under FINRA rules, which of the following activities by a registered rep requires written notification outside business activities outside business activities. Volunteering isn't a business activity, it's things you do for pay. Getting lucky in Las Vegas is not something you do for pay. Ah, don't get hung up here. They're trying to do the Jedi mind trick on you. That has nothing to do with Uber or Lyft, it's just it's for pay. So any outside activity for pay would require written notice to your employer and then they can restrict that if they think there's an adverse interest. Uh, cover call, a cover, a cover, writer covers a position. This answer set is very testable. This answer set is very testable. And so let's just go through what each of these answers uh, are. Let's go through what each of these answers are. Let me get that thing here. I'm going to get a smaller font just so we don't have a whole lot of room here. Uh, a closing sale is used to eliminate or reduce or offset a long position. A closing purchase, a closing purchase is used. That's what closing means, eliminate, reduce, or offset. Used to eliminate or reduce or offset a short position. And so let's see, when we write a call, a write a call, that's what we did in opening sale. And so the way we're gonna get rid of that, uh, opening purchase, by the way, would be used to establish or add to a long position. So we did an opening sale. So the way we're gonna get rid of that is a closing purchase. That is very much an answer set I'd be prepared for. Very much an answer set I'd be prepared for. Uh, there's a lot of words for writer of the option contract, seller, short, all that means the same things. Again, I would refer you to my lecture one on options. Lecture one is introduction and nomenclature uh, for option contracts. And I go through this at length and nauseum. So uh, if you need some help, more help on that, it's available to you. Uh, this one, we did a covered, we wrote, so we're short. So we're gonna do a closing purchase. We're gonna buy that option back. What we're hoping is we sold it high and we can buy it back low. In a period of low inflation and economic recession, remember what that means? That was testable. Economic recession, test question is two calendar quarters of declining GDP. If we have two calendar quarters of declining GDP, that's an officially in a recession. That is testable by the way. You know, uh, depression is six calendar quarters, but. Anyways, you should definitely know about monetary policy, the money supply. Monetary policy, the money supply is controlled by the Federal Reserve Board. You know, too much money chasing too few goods is a problem, that's inflation. Too many goods and not enough money is a problem, that's deflation. And so our central bank, our Federal Reserve is, uh, has a dual mandate. Uh, one of the mandates they have, one mission they have is price stability, price equilibrium. Another mission they have is full employment. Right now they're following their mandate about full employment uh, right now through monetary policy. 
And the way they do that is through contr uh, controlling interest rates. Now, fiscal policy is government spending and taxation, and that's uh, handled by Congress and the president. At some point, I'll put a lecture up on economics. It's, you know, I don't have one up there yet, but at some point I'll do so because you know it's, it's on all the certain questions are on all the tests. So here you should have been able to eliminate A because you should have known that the Federal Reserve Board doesn't have a control fiscal policy. They don't control government spending and taxation. So that gets rid of A. Now, what we're trying to do here in low inflation economic recession is the Fed is trying to reignite what Lord John Maynard Keynes called the animal spirits. And the way they're going to do that is by lowering interest rates, making more money more available. In fact, that's what they've been doing uh, over the last several months, right? Uh, it's up to 120, 30 billion a month that the Fed is buying in bonds. And so when the Fed is buying $120 billion worth of bonds each month, the money goes out, the bonds come in. So that means the price and you know, the money supply goes up and interest rates go down. You know, that's what they would be doing here. And that's what they're doing presently as we speak. Now, what they do is they step on the brakes, they've raised the Fed fund rate. Fed funds is test. Well, Fed funds is banks with excess reserves lending to banks with deficient reserves. Now you should have been able to get rid of B because the Fed doesn't directly control the Fed funds rate, they target it. You know, that's what banks with excess reserve charges. The most volatile the rates you're held accountable for changes the most often. The rate the Fed does control, test question, is the discount rate. And so you're gonna get tested on, uh, you know, four interest rates, uh, Fed funds, uh, discount, uh, broker call, and uh, prime and discount is the one the fed actually sets directly you know broker call is used to finance margin accounts that's what banks charge brokerage firms for money and uh, prime is what banks major commercial banks charge their best corporate customers this is what apple or google or microsoft pay their bank to borrow money i joke it's what you pay to borrow money if you don't need to borrow any and then they wouldn't want to increase the reserves if they tell the banks they have to keep more on the reserve to meet their everyday demand for banking that would contract the money supply, interest rates would go up, and that's not what they're trying to do. So, you know, we don't expect, you know, on the test that you're going to be an economist, but as I joke, they assume on the test that you're not going to embarrass the firm at a cocktail party. And I told you, if you don't want to embarrass the firm at a cocktail party, and somebody asks you about economics or finance or investments, you want to sound smart, say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound good. And they say, well, what about them? You say they fluctuate. They go up and they go down. They go up and they go down. When selling a fixed amount of the base currency to purchase a counter uh, currency. You know, I spent a lot of time in Mexico, so the base currency is US. So yeah, I wouldn't do this in real, but for test purposes, so let's say Dean turns his dollars into uh, pesos. When I go into Mexico, when I come out of Mexico, I turn the pesos back into dollars. You know, last time I checked, it was uh, about 20 pesos to the dollar, but that's not the spot rate. The spot rate is the current exchange rate. So if I call my guy and say, hey, what's the spot rate on the peso? He says, Dean, uh, you know, it's 18 and a half to one, whatever the case may be. So that's called the spot rate when trading currencies. You know, when you buy and sell a security without paying for the buy, when you buy and sell a security without paying for the buy, that's called a free ride. Because you didn't use your money to make that transaction, use broker dealer money. Now, prior to 1934, we as broker dealers were in charge of credit extension to our customers. And when we were in charge of credit extension to our customers, the roaring 20s, you give me 10 grand, I'd loan you nine grand to purchase securities. Woo, and then I'd also lend you money to buy IPOs, woo. You know, in 1934, we took that authority away from broker dealers and we gave it to the Federal Reserve Board. So Reg T is part of 34. It's about credit extension of broker dealers to customers. And so if a customer buys and sells without paying for the buy, I have to impose a restriction on the account. The restriction, by the way, the restriction is not that he can't trade with me. What I'm freezing or restricting is your credit privileges. So moving forward, I'm going to want the money in the account if you want to buy a stock or delivery of the stock before you sell. Call protection is most valuable to a bond owner when bond prices are generally. Now be careful. Uh, again, there's a lot of ways to go. You know, if you, you know, if you're with Dean, you know, everybody has a different way of doing this. But you know, if you're, when I do my secondary transaction thing, I warned you, I like to draw a flat line represents a bond at par. And it says call protection when bond prices are. So what we said we're concerned about 
is that if interest rates go down, and this is interest rates over here, and the bond price goes up and now it's trading at a premium, it becomes much, much more likely that the issuer is gonna call these bonds. And I'm not gonna receive what's called yield to maturity. I'm gonna receive yield to call. Now this question is kind of tricky because they didn't ask me about interest rates. I could miss this really quickly. I say, oh, I got an easy one. Interest rates are falling. They didn't ask about that. They asked about bond prices. So with bond prices, if interest rates are falling, that's when call protection becomes most valuable. That means that the bond prices are going up. Uh, I would also know what call protection consists of. I'd also know what call protection consists of. The call protection consists of time and price. How long before the issuer can call the bond and at what price can they call the bond? Time and price. Some bonds you know, have call protection, some bonds do not. My Ford Motor Company debentures were callable in five years. So that's the call protection period, five years, and they were callable at par. That's not so good. It would have been better if they were callable 101 or 102 or uh, something like that. Well, an index fund, welcome to you know Vanguard, right? They got what, $4 trillion over there? I don't know how much of it is their index fund with an S&P 500 index fund. My guess would be kind of a couple of trillion dollars, right? <laughs> um, your protection of a principal during bearish markets. No, what you're in an index fund, what you're saying is you're willing to expect a market-based return. You're saying, you know what? I'll take a market-based return. I think the idea of, uh, you know, paying a monkey to harvest bananas, I'm being facetious, you know, monkeys harvest bananas, they eat the product and here the product is money. And so active management means there's going to be more expenses. I mean, by the way, they, because the manager charges more, the investment advisor is the largest single expense. The more my expertise, the more I'm going to charge you. So you certainly don't get protection during a bearish market in index fund, no. High turnover. Now they have low turnover and that's what gives them the lower expense ratio, right? Because they're, they're not turning over the assets. They have higher management fees. No, no, no. They have lower management fees because uh, of the passive management. So D. All the following apply to both foreign and domestic debt instruments except. So in both foreign and domestic debt instruments, I do have political risk. You know, I have the risk that, you know, the administrations change and, you know, investments change as a result of that. You know, whether interest is deductible perhaps or not. Now, if I buy a domestic debt instrument, I don't have exchange rate, right? Because I'm being paid in dollars and I'm a U.S. citizen. But if I own a, um, a Mexico grants a denario bond, the revoke Mexico, Mexico issued a 100 year non callable bond at three and a half percent, again, I have that exchange rate, right? Because I'm gonna have to turn the pesos back in dollars. In this case, I couldn't believe this. This was during uh, Nieto's administration, but it was denominated in euros. So even, even Mexico has foreign currency risk because they can't print pesos, right? But whether I'm being paid in euros or pesos or UN, that's the Chinese currency, I gotta turn that back into dollars. So. By the way, if you have any kind of international perspective, you're at risk on this test because the test assumes that the center of the financial universe is New York and the whole world revolves around uh, New York. So exchange risk is not domestic, that's just foreign. And that's, we gotta be careful on those accepts. Those are easy to trip up on. Which of the following communications with the public is considered misleading? Well, you better be able to say past performance is not indicative of future results. You should never be talking about the future. You know, my crystal ball is broke. All I can tell you about is the past, right? So anytime you start predicting future performance, you're going to be in trouble. Now, I joke, ours is the only business that's actually true of, you know, um, Aaron Rodgers' past performance is indicative of his future results. Uh, which of the long statements is true about all U.S. government securities? Uh, a, they're exempt from federal taxes. That is not true. That is not true. You do owe federal income tax on US government securities, agency securities. They're exempt from 33, that is indeed true. When Congress passed 33, they said your own government wouldn't rip you off. And so the US government and government sponsored enterprises are exempt from registration under 33, meaning they can sell brand new securities to the public without giving prospectuses, without doing a registration statement. The two big ones, by the way, are the government and government sponsored enterprises and then uh, munis, municipal issuers are exempt as well. Their general obligation to the federal government? No, that would be correct if they were, you know, T-bills or T-notes or T-bonds. Uh, 
Treasury stock. Well, treasury stock is companies that have excess capital. Now, recently, uh, Mr. Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, has made a tender offer to its existing shareholders, offering to buy back the stock they own in Berkshire Hathaway. Now, Berkshire Hathaway could have done that in the open market, but they decided to go directly to their, their shareholders. And Mr. Buffett said this is a way of calling the shareholder list to see who really is into Berkshire Hathaway long term. And so I would call you and say, hey, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is making a tender offer for your stock. Would you like to accept that offer or not? Now, that's considered to be stock that has been reti retired or reacquired. And Treasury stock has no voting rights and it pays no dividends. It has no voting rights and it pays no dividends. So A and B are just completely false. It is issued stock that has been reacquired by the corporation, right? And you know, if you're an existing owner, you don't tender, your proportion of ownership goes up. So that's kind of cool. It's authorized stock that has not been issued. No, you definitely should. Maybe I'll just put it, uh, put the text box here. You know, this, what you got to have a handle on is there is authorized stock. There is issued stock. There is treasury stock. That's what we're talking about now. And there's outstanding. Outstanding is the issued less treasury. So depending on what they ask you would depend on the appropriate response. If I ask the maximum number of shares a corporation can issue under terms of its charter, that's authorized. If I say shares that have been placed with investors, that's issued. As I say stock that has been reacquired by the corporation, that's treasury. If I say issued less treasury, that's outstanding. That's outstanding. Uh, very testable, very testable. So, you know, if I wrote uh, an index option, right, so settled by the delivery of, and I had to deliver 100 shares of 100 stocks, nobody would play. So we agree that when we're trading options, index options, and you exercise, I just have to come up with the intrinsic value, the cash. I don't have to, thank goodness, deliver the underlying index, because if that were true, nobody would play with you. I would also know that index options and all option contracts Settle T plus one. Option contracts. That means that's when the money is going to be debited or credited to your account. Again, I would refer you to uh, options lecture number one, introduction to options, introduction nomenclature of options, uh, lecture one in my uh, four lecture series on options. Uh, we go over all this kind of stuff for you, all this kind of stuff for you. Blue sky, you know, you need to know what under blue sky you're under. It's not coincidental that every time you leave state, state A and you go into state B, there's a sign, leaving Nevada, welcome to California. Or, you know, leaving Nevada, welcome to Utah. So you know what the rules are. And so on the federal level, the SEC, you know, the SEC has primary jurisdiction, interpretation and enforcement of the domestic security laws of the United States of America. So as an investor, I'm here in Las Vegas, Clark County, Nevada, one level of protection I have is the feds, the SEC, but I also have what's called my state administrator who protects investors in the state of Nevada. That's my state administrator known as the state securities regulator. You know, uh, they all belong to a club called the North American Securities Administrator Association, NASA. And a lot of you, after you take your SIE, are gonna take an entire test on blue sky laws known as the Uniform Securities Act. You're gonna be taking either a 63, a 65 or a 66. Uh, on your SIE and your seven, your six, it's pretty mellow about the state administrator, state securities regulators, but I would warn you that in your next exam, not so much. It's gonna be a lot, uh, a lot of questions on that. Uh, which of the following investments are generally traded according to their average life rather than stated maturity dates? No, corporate bonds have a stated maturity date, five years, 10 years, government bonds, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, no. Yeah, asset-backed securities where we have, those are called pass-through investments like Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, Fannie Mac, CMO, CDOs. You know, those are asset-backed securities flow-through and they have a flow-through and the flow-through to the investors is based on the average life. An associated person is not registered. So what does that mean in English? Associated person, not registered, means you fill out a U4, you have a fingerprint card, but you haven't taken a test. You haven't taken a series six top off or a series seven top off. And under no circumstances should you be accepting unsolicited customer orders. 
I wait, all you can do is clerical things, solely clerical in nature, right? Uh, I think providing some of the account forms is pretty clerical. Discussing a particular investment, that's not clerical. Pre-qualifying customer isn't clerical. So given that answer set, it's B. To do A, C, or D, you got to take them past the top off. Uh, I like on these ones, I like to read the last sentence first and say, oh my goodness, let me see how this thing ends. So last sentence says, if the employee wants to support the campaign further, so that's a hint, further. So that means I've already provided some help without impacting the municipal securities business of the firm. So it sounds like they're asking about, you know, what is going to get me in trouble in terms of underwriting the bonds. He is permitted to make an additional contribution. So that's helpful. That means I already have given him some money up to what amount. All right, so now let's go back and see what my answer set is. Uh, I should know that it's 250 D is the maximum, but it says in the question last sentence that I kind of hints that I've given them some money already. So broker dealer seeks to underwrite a municipal securities offering by a local town in which the mayor is currently seeking re-election. A municipal finance professional resides in the town. That's important. That's important, resides because you can't give them any money if you don't can't vote for the guy. So it's important to say I reside in the town. I gave you 200, so I'm up to 200 of my 250, I got 50 left. The 13 months has nothing to do with it. It's per election cycle. It's per election cycle. So in the next election cycle, I've given him 200. This is a new one. He's in a, does it say he's in a re-election thing? So I got 50 left to give him. Uh, this is very much a test question. Aim and shoot, point and click. I would know the gross domestic products is the total goods and services an economy produces. And the U.S. is number one in GDP. There's nobody has more GDP than the U.S. China's number two. You know, Japan is number three. Germany is number four. Uh, I don't know if the U.K. is still five. It used to be not testable, but it's two calendar quarters of declining GDP. That's very much a name and shoot uh, point and click question. I told you 144A is very testable. We said 144A is allows restricted stock. Remember, that's the same synonymous with unregistered stock to quibs. And remember what that was? That's somebody managing over $100 million. Uh, one other thing I'd be aware of for test purposes. You know, um, it doesn't have to be a quib that does this, but this is pretty common in a quib. You know, Tesla has said that they're going to a, a issue uh, $5 billion worth of uh, additional equity, new stock, stock that's authorized, but Tesla has not issued and they're going to be issuing it. T row price is a quip. And so T row price might call, call Tesla, Elon, say, hey, listen, uh, we'll, we'll buy the whole $5 billion in stock right now that is restricted. We'll hold it six months. And since we're going to give you a check right now for the entire $5 billion, we're going to want a discounted price. And that's called a pipe, a private investment. What we mean by private is, again, they're buying restricted stock, this quib, and a public entity, meaning there is a public marketplace for the stock, in this case, uh, Tesla. Uh, I have a lot of people on debrief tell me they encounter pipes uh, on their exam. Uh, a question, not a whole bunch of questions, but a question. There's always a step up in the basis, so it doesn't matter whether this is a mutual fund or any other type of investment. The answer here would always be A. So when you die, they assume that what you did is pass, you know, your estate just passed that to your heirs. Now, it's not a problem for your heirs because they're going to assume whatever today's current market value is, but it might be a problem for your estate because they're going to have to pay an estate tax perhaps. But that's called a step, up, a step up. That's how we refer to that in the business. And that's how you might want to try and remember that. The basis is stepped up, you know, on, based on market value of death. A uh, company announces a tender offer to a shareholder with the intent to buy a maximum million shares of its outstanding stock at 10. Remember this, this is treasury stock. So you own some stock, I'm your broker, and I call you, I say, hey, you know that stock we uh, own? You say, yeah, I own that thousand shares, it's been a good ride. I said, well, they're uh, reaching out to uh, the existing shareholders like yourself, and they're offering to uh, you know, buy some stock at 10. You say, well, that sounds like an excellent deal. That's a little higher than today's market price. I, I think about selling anyways, I'll accept the offer. I say, cool. Now there is a maximum of a million. So, 
you know, if we, we have more than a million shares tendered, some people are not going to get their stock sold. They're not going to be able to get this $10. I said, but I'll keep you posted. So after close of the uh, period, the 900,000 shares had been tendered. So that means the issuer said they'd buy all of them, right? Because they set up to a million. So uh, I caused to call you and say, hey, they, yeah, all thousand shares were purchased by the corporation. And we're now that thousand shares is what we call treasury stock. And that treasury stock has no voting and pays no dividends. A very testable, we're gonna torment you on money market securities. You know, you need to make sure that you have a handle on all the money market securities found on your test, uh, T-bills, uh, commercial paper, uh, bankers acceptances. All of these are issued at a discount. Um, bankers accepted commercial paper, have a 270 day max maturity. Uh, bankers acceptances are used to facilitate foreign trade. So boy, make sure you review that area because this is, you know, two, three, four potential questions. Uh, another one that we have that's uh, kind of a funky one is a negotiable jumbo CD. And negotiable means a CD with a secondary market. That's what negotiable means. Jumbo means over hundred grand and that too is a money market instrument. That one doesn't, uh, isn't issued and doesn't trade at a discount. A syndicate desk, primary purpose of a syndicate desk. So uh, this week we had a company go public called Affirmed and the lead underwriter, the person who runs the syndicate desk was JP Morgan. So what does JP Morgan do at the syndicate desk as the lead underwriter? Uh, they build what's called the order book and they allocate the stock. You know, some people are gonna get it now. Uh, Affirmed decided to go NASDAQ. So if I didn't get you an allocation through the primary, we can step into NASDAQ and buy it there perhaps. But uh, the answer is B. Uh, the spread. So maybe let me post a quote. I'm a market maker. I'm a market maker. And maybe I give you a quote. You say, Dean, what's your quote? I say, my quote is 10, 10 by 10, 25 by 10. Now, what does that mean in English? What that means in English, let's put this over here. This is my bid. And this is my ask. And I provide liquidity in the market. And what I'm trying to do is capture that spread. So I'm telling you, I'm willing to buy 25 round lots into my inventory at 10 and sell a 10 round lots. That's 100 shares, 1,000 at 10, 10. And that is indeed called the spread. The difference between that. So I'm going to make 10 cents there. Over the counter means a negotiated quote driven market. Again, I would refer you to my lecture on secondary markets. It's over an hour long, it goes, kills this stuff. So you do that uh, lecture, I think you'll be in pretty good shape. Again, here we're just doing explication. We're not trying to re-lecture uh, this material. Just wanna give you a heads up on the kind of thing that you are held accountable to know. Uh, definitely would know that treasury bonds and options are T plus one next business day. Settlement is when ownership changes hands. So. Trade day is when we agree to terms. Uh, settlement is when this money comes in or out of your account, depending on what side of the transaction you're on. Now, be careful. This could have very easily been C if they would have asked for regular rate settlement on a corporate or a muni bond or a corporate stock. That's T plus two. It would have been C, right? So uh, the answer here, because it's a treasury, is uh, B, T plus one. Senator Roth is no longer around to protect his Roth IRA, but you know, if you're a senator and you came up with this idea, we name it after you. So this was Senator Roth and he came up with a uh, 401k and an IRA where you're using after-tax money to fund it, money you've already paid taxes on. So A is out. I just told you it's made with the money you've already paid taxes on. They do have maximum contribution uh, limits. Uh, one of them does and one of the others don't, but it says neither do and they do, right? One of them says you make X number of dollars and so this is not for you. They're means tested, so B is false. Uh, neither account is subject to the early distribution penalties. That's not true. But once you reach the uh, age of 59 and a half, you can get that money out uh, free of, uh, exclude from federal income tax. How cool is that? I think this should be a question about legislative risk. In English, what I would know is it doesn't have a required minimum distribution. There is no RMD. Well, again, Dean told you, you're always going to have in a forward split more shares at a lower price 
earlier we had a reverse split and Dean told you less shares at a higher price. So I need something more than a thousand. So it's either C or D and I need something less than 50. So if you don't wanna do the math, you just need to shop the answer set, more shares at a lower price. A registered rep wants to play some mutual fund advertisement. You need to make sure that you get a principle of your approval to run any advertisement. Your FINRA, your principal then will make sure it's okay with compliance or the FINRA or whoever. So, but your registered principal, always when that's in your answer set, man, I'd take it. Anytime they say, should you check with your principal on something? I'd say, yeah, that's a series 24 or nine or 10, depending on what you're doing. Who cares? That's not Tesla. I'm just telling you who that is. Ain't you is the point. Uh, no load mutual funds may have lower expense ratios than load mutual funds for which of the following reasons? No load funds do not charge promotional expenses. 12B1 fee is a promotional expense paid by the fund for marketing. And that's not true. No load funds can have a 12B1 fund, but it can exceed one quarter of 1%, 25 basis points. Or you want to sound like a player, 25 bips. So, you know, the uh, other funds can go up to three quarters of 1%. So uh, B by definition. The sales charge isn't a part of the what the expense ratio of mutual fund. Sales charge is not paid by the fund. That's paid by the investor. So the C is not a part of the answer. Uh, and fund management fees are always lower. That's not true. They may depend on their expertise, but you know, the answer is B. Uh, broker dealers. In any one transaction, the broker is acting as an agent and charging a commission, or acting as a dealer, acting as a principal for a profit. So you know, if you open an account with me at um, Goldman Sachs, I say, we are a broker dealer. And in some transactions you do at uh, Goldman Sachs, we're gonna charge you commission on your behalf. We're gonna reach out to someone else and get the security and you're gonna owe us for doing so. Now, in other transactions you do with us at, Mer at uh, Goldman Sachs, we're gonna be acting in our dealer principal capacity In any one transaction, we're either to be a broker or a dealer or a firm. That's always disclosed on the confirmation and I can't be both in terms of capacity. So I'm gonna tell you now, the way you can remember this is ABC, agent broker commission. And so when I charge a commission, I'm acting as an agent, right? So Brokers act as agents. So in any one transaction, I'm gonna tell you, say some transactions you with us here at Goldman Sachs, we're acting in our broker capacity. On your behalf, we're gonna get it elsewhere. We're gonna charge you a commission. Other transactions, we're acting as a print dealer or principal, we're gonna charge you a mark up or a mark down. Again, I would refer you to my lecture on secondary markets where we, we kill that, we kill that. Underwriter is a different relationship that can be either, and we'll talk about that later. Oh, let's clear up our slide here. All right, anti-money laundering programs, we said are very testable. Very testable. We said, boy, make sure you got that down. The AML officer, annual AML test, uh, FinCEN, Bank Secrecy Act, currency transaction report, suspicious activity reports, five grand, 10 grand, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, placement, layering integration. Uh, make sure you've uh, got that. So we have to have a AML officer, somebody who's a DFI, designated for incarceration. I'm joking, but <laughs> I'm a retired broker. And I had a friend call me and said, hey, Dean, why don't you come out of retirement and be my you know, AML officer? Absolutely not. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, you're doing all that business in China that's coming over here offshore. He goes, well, we're legit. I said, I know you're legit, but you know, it could be a problem, is a problem, never be a problem. If I never do that, I'll never be involved in it. So uh, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. The call provision of a bond stipulates which of the following factors. Well, we said the call date and the call price. And we said that's called call protection. And we said that's a nifty thing to have on a bond, particularly when interest rates are going down and the bond price is going up because it becomes more likely they're going to call the bond. The issuer is going to call that bond away from you, make you turn it in. So they can replace that high cost debt with lower cost debt. Uh, 33 is required for which of the following? Well, Euro dollar bonds are uh, offered in Europe, but denominated in US dollars. And while the SEC would like to run the world, they do not. 
And we said municipal issuers are exempt from 33. And we said the US government is exempt from 33. So by process of elimination, it's an American depository receipt. When I buy an American depository receipt, I'm buying a foreign security that's trading US as a US security in our domestic market. For example, Telefonos to Mexico is a monopoly phone carrier in Mexico. And I can buy Telefonos to Mexico as a Mexican security in the Mexican market, or I can buy Telefonos to Mexico as an American depository receipt. If I buy that as an American depository receipt, what I'm buying is the New Mexico City branch of Bank of New York. There's a thousand shares of Telefonos to Mexico of which Dean is the beneficial owner. And it's just much easier to buy it in the US market, right? I mean, you know, if I buy in the Mexican market, I'm getting an annual report in Espanol. I don't read Espanol. It'd be nice for somebody to translate that to Inglés and translate accounts from pesos dollars. So just easier. A test question, I still have foreign currency risk because they're collecting the phone bills in pesos. As I mentioned, it used to be 10 pesos a buck, now it's 20. So, you know, my dividend gets cut in half. Uh, treasure notes, we said uh, are paid semi-annually. That's testable, know how things pay. Stocks, if they pay, pay quarterly. They may or may not pay dividend, but if they do so, it'd be quarterly. Uh, at maturity, remember that could have been the answer. That would be those commercial paper, bankers' acceptances, uh, T-bills. So this one is B. Uh, stock split. Who's gonna maintain the record of the shareholders? It's usually the transfer agent or registrar. It's not the depository trust corporation. It's not the issuer. The issuer farms this out. It's not the custodian. Longest period, that's very testable. So remember we said rights are short-term exercisable below. That's your right to maintain proportion ownership in the corporation. You have a right to do that. Options, you know, a LEAP goes out technically, that don't even know this, but LEAP stands for long-term equity appreciation potential security. And a LEAP goes out technically 39 months, but in practice 30. And so that's as far as you can go in option. The vast majority of options are less than a year. But warrants are long-term and exercisable below the current market price. You know, in 2010, Bank of America issued 700 million warrants to buy Bank of America Common at $7.14 to Berkshire Hathaway. At the time, Bank of America was a $6 stock. So 10 years from 10 years from 2010 until 2020, uh, Berkshire Hathaway could have exercised, and they did in 2015, five years, they exercised those warrants. And so warrants are long-term exercisable below. Repos are used in uh, money market uh, transactions. You know, when I go to the Fed to borrow money as a bank, remember this idea about the uh, discount rate? I'm gonna give the bank my treasury bonds as collateral and I'm gonna agree to repurchase them. And so a repo is where I agree to repurchase my collateral for an overnight loan. Again, overnight loan, not long-term. Under normal circumstance, a letter of intent. Uh, I started my career as a retail broker and I, I ended up an institutional broker. But years ago, when I was a retail broker, I don't know if this is still true, but I did a lot of business in the Franklin funds. That was kind of my go-to uh, product. And in those days, I don't know if this is still true, but Franklin had a break point at hundred grand or more. And in those days, under 100 grand, you pay 4%. Uh, over 100, 100 grand or more, you pay 3%. And so, you know, uh, you say, Dean, how much should I invest? And I say, you ought to invest $99,999. That's a big, big no no, but that's called a breakpoint sale. Breakpoints are good, but breakpoint sales are bad. That's why I'm trying to maximize my commission by avoiding the breakpoint. The easiest way to stay out of trouble breakpoints are good, quiet discounts, breakpoint sales are bad. is tell you all the ways to get the reduced sales charge. So I say, well, you say, Dean, all I have for my initial investment is $80,000. I say, well, do you think that over the next 13 months, you might be able to come up with an additional 20? If so, let's get you a, a break point. Let's say get you sign a letter of intent. You know, if you tell Franklin, not binding on you, that you intend, you're going to try hard to come up with this extra 20, they'll give you the reduced sales charge today. So kind of cool. I'd also know that the uh, letter of intent can be backdated for 90 days. Uh, again, it's like learning a foreign language. So the last transaction, XYZ, XYZ is the issuer. Uh, five and a half is the coupon. That's the interest rate on the bonds. They mature in 2031. They trade as a percentage of par. 
par is a thousand. So this is trading at 102% of par, which would be 1,020. And when it's trading above par, that's a premium. And that means that since this bond was issued, interest rates have gone down, causing the bond to go up. Uh, $10,000, very much, I told you, money laundering. Make sure you're solid on money laundering. You know, certain areas like money laundering, money market securities that, you know, are heavily tested. And we said, you're gonna file this uh, CTR. Remember who you file that with? You file that with FinCEN, FinCEN. Uh, SAR, no, SAR would go to FinCEN as well. So it's A. 529s uh, vary from state to state in terms of what they allow you to do. And so in terms of determining suitability, it would be really important that you know what state 529 you're using and how they treat it in that particular state. So, uh, you know, very important in terms of suitability. You know, I have to do tell you what I'm doing to protect the information that I've given to you, you've given to me. You know, you're, you have it, by the way, this is for everybody, not just brokerage firms, but our standard is even much higher because we, we have financial information on you. And so which of the following must the firm provide uh, to the customer about privacy and opt-out notices? The address of the firm's website, no, the fee to opt out, oh my goodness, reduction of the ridiculous is a test taking trick. I can't be charging you to opt out from being able to solicit you for other things using your information, no. The deadline, I can't have a deadline, no, I gotta tell you what I'm doing to protect it and I gotta tell you how to opt out and say, Dean, don't keep this information or don't use this information for any other purpose than that which it was provided to you. Selling way is gonna be on the test. Remember what this is? This is when you get customers involved in an investment not sponsored by your broker dealer without permission. That is a very much a test question. Very much a test question. At most firms, by the way, that's a strike three offense. You know, the first thing you wanna do is ask your firm for the approved product list, everything that's on the firm's approved product list, the things you are allowed to get people involved in. Uh, stock split, remember the whole point of a stock split is the uh, price per share decreases and there's no change in proportion in ownership. So it doesn't say reverse, we'd assume it's forward unless they say differently. So you definitely know that you should know there's no change in proportion in ownership. So you have more shares at a lower price, but so does everybody else. Well, here's this quote again. This is from the dealer's perspective. So let's put that on there. So so this is the bid. And this is the ask. It's always from the dealer's perspective. It's always from the dealer's perspective. So I'm willing to buy as a market maker into my inventory, 25 round lots at 10. And I'm willing to sell 10 round lots, 1,000 at 10, 10. So, you know, you might want to put here market maker buys. Uh, market maker sells. And uh, let me get a different color. <laughs> Customer sells. And that color kind of sucks. Let me get a different color. Trying to find one that shows up. So whenever a customer is looking at two prices, the customer always pays the high price and always receives the low price. What's that called? The securities industry. So the customer is always gonna pay this high price and always gonna receive that low price. So now they're asking me, what do I have to be willing to do? So I have to sell a thousand shares at 10. No, I didn't say that. I'm sell a thousand shares at 10, 10, no. Buy 2,500 at 10. Yep, let just clear that up here. Let me clear this up. So buy 2,500 to 10, so there's my 10, yep. And sell a thousand shares, yeah. 
by the way, very testable. What's that called if I don't, if I don't do this? So B is the right answer. And if I don't do that test question, that's called selling, or excuse me, backing away. Backing away, they'll say on your exam, a market maker fails to honor a firm quote. This is a prohibited practice and is known as, and you got to come up with selling away, selling away. A customer has a uh, cash balance in her account, a cash balance in her account. Uh, with long positions of several securities, she's made no securities transactions. How often? The test question here is quarterly. I would know the circumstances under which she's going to get it monthly. Monthly is if she has a penny stock in her account. That's very testable. So it would have been monthly if she has a penny stock. And a penny stock is a non-NASDAQ OTC stock under five. So non-NASDAQ OTC stock. That's a bulletin board penny stock under five. Then she gets a monthly. Otherwise, it's quarterly. That's very much a test issue. A member of a stock exchange who provides liquidity, you know, as a market maker on the New York, as a designated market maker specialist, I agree that I'll maintain liquidity. I'll can have a continuous R R market, meaning if there's all sellers and no buyers, I buy. If there's all buyers and no sellers, uh, I sell. And that's why I do. I provide liquidity. And that's a uh, market maker. By the way, he's known as the designated market maker. And again, I would refer you to uh, my lecture on secondary markets where we kill that. Under FINRA rules, non-cash compensation. So let's see, your commission is definitely cash, but a gift isn't cash. Meals isn't cash, lodging isn't cash. So, you know, in other words, the FINRA may consider gifts you receive as part of your compensation. They may consider meals that you receive, lodging you receive as non-cash compensations. It says, except commissions are cash compensation. So uh, D, by the way, remember this is about the gift or gratuity rule, it's $100. You know, we're not supposed to be compromising people. You should be selling the product because it's in the client's best interest, not because of uh, non-cash non -cash compensation. Uh, we said that uh, you have a right to maintain your proportion ownership in a company. That's called your preemptive right. That amounts to your first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares. The way we do that, it's a rights offering. And the rights are a test question, short-term exercisable below the current market price, very testable short-term exercisable below the current market price. You have to be on the test to contrast rights versus warrants. And then you, if you're an existing shareholder, you can trade those rights, you can exercise those rights, oh, those rights can expire. Uh, inflationary risk. Inflationary risk is too much money chasing too few goods. And you know, common stocks are typically better inflation hedges than are uh, fixed income or debt securities. Uh, blue chips. Blue chips are the most expensive chip in poker. And in the business and the securities industry, a blue chip is a corporation who has a proven track record in good times and bad. That's what a blue chip is. And uh, blue chip stocks, you know, typically stocks are better hedges because whatever experience, any inflation, the business experiences will be passed through to the consumer. A test question is a defensive stock. A defensive stock is stock in a corporation whose products and services are resilient to the business cycle. And regardless of the business cycle, you need your power. Nobody wants to go back to the stone age. You must cut, much cut back on usage, but you're not cutting back entirely. So by process of elimination, I have B or C, B or C. So now I'm down to treasury bills and treasury bonds because A and D stocks are better inflation hedges or have less inflationary risk than do debt denominated securities. That's very testable. Now T bill, whatever, inflation is doing, I'm averaging into a T-bill with a higher return. So, you know, every three, six, or, you know, uh, 12 months, I'm getting a high return. So the one that's going to be most exposed is that treasury bond. Remember this longer term uh, bonds are exposed to more risk. All right. So uh, so I hope you uh, found this uh, helpful. Um, I'll be posting this uh, to the YouTube channel and uh, Make sure you do all your practice questions. And if you have any uh, questions about this, just uh, uh, send them along. You can either put them in the com comment box on the uh, video itself, if it's about a particular question uh, or you know something like that, uh, this or in the general comment box. All right, uh, 
Hope you have a good uh, good rest of your time. Keep uh, stay dedicated, stay disciplined, stay organized, and you should be able to make your mark.